On today's show, we have Dr. Selena McGee from Edmond, Oklahoma, talking about cosmetics and optometry on the OI Show. So, Dr. Selena McGee, first and foremost, thank you for being on the show. Really, really, really appreciate you taking the time here. Um, I'll tell you, the impetus to inviting you on this show was... Um, an interesting lecture that I heard you give with Dr. Luis Scalfani, I think it was two years ago now, and it was the cosmetic side of optometry, and it was talking about a lot of the procedures that optometry was starting to perform. And, and I remember I, I was in the class, and I, I didn't know you at the time. And I, I remember you starting to talk about Botox and, and just a lot of the the wrinkles and the lines and the, you had kind of, I, I remember you even had like drawings on pictures of patients. And I remember looking back thinking, I thought this was an optometry course. I didn't know that this was like a, a medical course. And then I saw the course and I thought, okay, I'm in the right class. And I thought this has to be a medical doctor that's, that's giving this class. And I saw your credentials and you're an optometrist and you practice in Oklahoma. And, and at that point I realized that when you go in, when you go in on something in optometry, um, in particular when scope allows it, you can really propel yourself to do really whatever your passion is. And, and, and I see that with you. So, you know, I really wanted to hone in and focus on that cos cosmetic component of optometry and, and share with us really how you've kind of developed that within your own practice and, and your four walls and, and what you're doing with patients as well too. Cause this, this will be, a new topic for most optometrists that are listening to this podcast. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And you're right. It is different for an optometrist to be, you know, not only talking about these, but leading these conversations. But I think it is very important for optometry to certainly be at the table and to, to lead these conversations. So I'll start with what I offer in my practice, and then I'll walk you through why I do it that way. So we do neurotoxins. So I've been doing that for, oh gosh, probably close to four to five years at this point now. And then I also have radio frequency, which is a device that we use for skin tightening. And then of course, intense pulse light, which we all have heard you know, a lot about and just very recently in the dry eye disease space, right? Yeah. And I do have a, a dry eye center of excellence that was born out of just treating my primary care patients. And it's amazing the knowledge that we all have and walk around with that we don't even realize that we really have as optometrists. So, you know, one of the easy things to talk about is cosmetic ingredients, right? Because that piece, and a lot of people aren't comfortable talking about makeup or cleansers or the fact that, you know, when you look at the guidelines of what the US does as far as the FDA and what they approve, they ban 11 ingredients. Whereas in Europe, they ban about 1500 ingredients. Wow. <laughs> yes. And our, when I tell patients that they're just blown away and they're like, well, wait a minute, but I spent a lot of money on this product that I, I love. And in so fact, Selena, Selena, can I stop you yeah. just for a second? So just to make sure that we're clear, because again, you're going to be more familiar with cosmetics than I am. So, so there's then products that you can get here in the U S because the lack of bans on them, but you wouldn't be able to sell that product in Europe because the contents of that makeup just wouldn't be allowed to be sold there. Is that, no, am I, no. that that's a correct statement. Wow. That is correct statement. Wow. 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 And, uh, you know, the FDA hasn't touched the Cosmetic Act since 1938. So you're allowed... Do you think we've learned anything since 1938? Or... <laughs> just, a, just a few things, right? <laughs> and so there's so many things that our, our patients are utilizing that is either causing dry eye disease and upsetting homeostasis on the front surface or sabotaging our best intentions when we're treating our patients. And so it's super important for us to be comfortable talking about those types of things because they're not getting that information from, you know, the Instagram person that's getting paid on the other side to talk about the product. Right, right, they're, right, right, right. So that piece is a, a very um, easy way to like to, to dip your toe into cosmetics, you know, and the reality is we all, 
fit contact lenses. Most of us have an optical. So those two pieces are in fact cosmetic. I mean, a lot of our patients want to change the way they look, whether it's with new glasses or because they don't like the way they look in glasses, they want to wear contact lenses. So we're already in this space. I'm just building on it and expanding. And so, Selena, do you, do you have any specific recommendations for makeup options for patients that, or for practitioners that are looking for things that are less likely to disrupt the homeostasis or less likely to cause some of these issues? Definitely. So it's really hard to look for one brand. So teach people to look for certain ingredients and to seek out, you know, more clean makeup lines. And one that comes to mind that I actually do carry in my practice is Eyes Are the Story. And that was founded by the same person that, that works a lot with TFOS. And so, you know, she has spent many years cultivating and working on this, I think almost 15 years. And she did go through the European guidelines. Well, so great. that's, you know, that's an easy one because it's mascara and eyeliner and there's a cleanser and some other pieces in it. And so I like it because we have control over what the patient's getting because they ask us, right? They always ask, well, what mascara should I use if these are all bad? Mm -hmm. And so that's a great way to segue into cosmetics as well. So how do patients get that? I know that you said you retail that in your practice. For those that may, maybe aren't interested in retailing that in their practice, would a patient just go online and get that? Is that the yep. access point? Super. We'll make sure we have the website on our show notes as well too. So the audience can get that if they, if they want that as well. That's great. Yes. And just, so just teach them the ingredients to avoid versus specific lines. That way they can use it. And there's two different apps that are great. There's one called Think Dirty and there is one. Yes. <laughs> I promise. it's Selena, ingredients. you, you know what this podcast is about, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one made by EWG and it's super easy. You, you just scan the QR code and it pops up like it'll red flag ingredients that are wow yeah and so that's a, a really easy way to share with your patient. so are those are those eye specific apps or are those other apps that are just like in general these ingredients that's yes. great we'll we'll have links to those apps in the in the show notes as well too fantastic yeah yeah so that's an easy way is to starting you know talking about cosmetics and you know don't be intimidated by that because when you're the patient on the other side of the slit lamp if you see something and we all see it, right? We see junk floating in the makeup. I mean, mm -hmm. I know, you know, mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. all kinds of clogged stuff behind the mybomian glands, you know, makeup that's been permanently embedded into that tissue. And if we don't say something about it, the patient then assumes that what they're doing is okay. Yeah. So yeah. we have to not be intimidated by those conversations. And I started those and I was very pleasantly surprised how receptive and how excited patients were and grateful that they had a resource. And so I talk about it with my preteen girls too, that aren't wearing makeup yet, but I want them to see me as the expert on what's safe for them to use versus, you know, the next YouTuber. Well, that's great. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that. So from a male's perspective, you know, we see females wearing makeup all the time and I'm one that's very heavy into patient education. So I like people seeing what's happening with their eyes. And oftentimes that involves a magnified view of the surface of their eyes. And oftentimes, you know, just the regular person, they're not used to seeing their eyelashes magnified to the level that they are. Um, and when they see that mascara that's clumped on there, it's pretty shocking for a patient to see that for the first time. So I always have to forewarn them about it. This is great that there are lines that are um, more cognizant of the health effects on the ocular surface. As much as we, Selena, we've talked about this for years, well, what's the risk factors for dry eye? We can't ignore that it happens at a ratio of four to five times greater in females than males. And one of the biggest things, there's, there's a lot of hormonal differences. There's a lot of just differences that we can underlie physiologically. But at the end of the day, the big kind of glaring gun is the, the makeup use. And, and we can't kind of overlook that. So, so I appreciate that you are kind of discussing that. So, so, so Selena, I want to take a step back and I want to talk about, so, so you're doing Botox in your practice. Yes. So and, let me tell you that, that 
short story, but here's the why. And here's why it's so important for us to work towards this. So when I got trained to do it, because, you know, we did learn how to do Botox for therapeutic blepharospasm mm -hmm. when we were in school, but we didn't learn the cosmetic side of things. So I took a course and it's very difficult to get trained because MDs don't want to train us. Right. But I paid my money and they were like, yeah, whatever you can, you can come. And my title on my name badge said practice manager. It didn't even have my OD credentials, <laughs> but there were 30 people in this class and it varied from, you know, nurse practitioners, RNs, uh, GPs. There were quite a few ER physicians even, and then dentists too. And of course I was the only optometrist, but there was a medical doctor that had passed her boards the night before. And I don't know about you, but, when I passed boards, like that was the smartest I was ever going to like be right at that moment before, you know, things started like filtering out <laughs> and getting lost. And so the, the proctor asked her what the muscle was around the eye and what its action was. And she's like, I have absolutely no idea. We didn't learn anything about the eye in medical school. That's so the hair on the back of my neck, like stood on end. And I was like, not only should we be doing this, like we are the most, I was the most qualified person in that room, room. to be doing it. Yep. So at that moment, I made a commitment that no matter if it failed miserably in my own practice, that I was going to start talking about this and why this is so important and why we should be doing this. And now that I've gotten into it and have done it longer and it is quite successful in my practice, I want to share that with others and encourage more people to, to do that because, you know, let's talk about dry eye for a second. If you get real aggressive with the orbicularis and you mess with the blink reflex, mm -hmm. so that's important. And those are questions that even if you're not doing the injections, you still should be asking your dry eye patients. Um, and so I, it makes perfect sense for us. And most of, of course, when we do Botox injections, we're staying, you know, periocular and adnexa, but that's where the first signs of aging happen are around our eyes. So very, very fun stuff. That is fun stuff. So, so give me what's, what's insights into kind of what's new and on the horizon in, in cosmetic optometry. So, you know, IPL comes into this beautifully, right? Because so many people are using it off label for meibomian gland dysfunction, mm -hmm. but that's a really powerful tool that you have in your hand that when you're working on meibomian glands and the inflammation associated with it, you know, patients have rosacea, they have fine lines, they have skin texture issues. There's lots of age photo damage around our eyes that can be addressed with that same tool that you've already got in your hand. It's just thinking a little bit bigger. And so that one, you know, makes perfect sense. Radio frequency has been around a long time. You know, people used to use and still do with Pelleve and that instrument and equipment comes with an Elman unit. And that's what we use for minor surgical procedures. So what I found in my practice was I purchased the Elman to do minor surgical procedures, you know, chalazia, cut off lumps and bumps. But I found that a whole lot more people had wrinkles than they do lumps and bumps. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted wrinkle reduction versus that. Mm -hmm. And so I just, it made perfect sense. So it's interesting how you pull a thread and it, it just, it continues. And so now, you know, new things on the horizon are non-ablative lasers, you can do ablative lasers around the eye. It works really well. Um, so there's more there. And when you can couple these procedures together, that's when you really get maximum effects because you're targeting collagen, you're, you know, targeting skin laxity. You're also targeting skin pigmentation and the way that texture looks, and then you're decreasing the muscle so that the wrinkle doesn't form in the first place. So when you can stack all that together, you can get some really awesome results. That's great. So Selena, just out of curiosity, what percentage of your patients that you're performing cosmetic procedures on are female versus male? Oof, it's probably 95% female. No, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's, Interesting. 
it over is, the last over the last two years, have you seen any trending, or is it like no, it's kind of stayed the same? It's really stayed the same, but I will say that my my male patients that goodness that really suffer with rosacea mm-hmm. and who have suffered for decades, and they just have given up in the way that they look and the way their eyes feel. When we do IPL and we make their dry eye disease better, they also are very grateful and thankful that their skin and the way they look. Yep. is better. So it's, it's kind of a backdoor yeah. approach to, yep. you know, targeting men, but it, it, it's there too. Well, Selena, thank you for sharing some of your time and expertise with us and audience. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Optometric Insights Show. Make sure you like us, make sure you follow our podcast and make sure you check out the show notes for what um, Selena was talking about with respect to resources as well too. And Selena, just again, another big, Huge, huge thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you for having me and letting me share my story.